Well, I'd like to begin with uh, the anniversary here of William Tyndale's uh, execution, burned, burned at the stake, and the, what is this? Son says, it says Bible reading was once forbidden by the Catholic Church. Um, and if a Bible, uh, if a copy of the Bible was, <coughs> what's that word? If anyone had a copy of the Bible, you had to give it to the church and then burn it. And William Tyndale, you ever heard of Tyndale House Publishing? His name lives on because he wanted the people that he translated the Bible into the New Testament. I mean the Bible into English. So the people could know what God had to say. What a thought. And they killed him. Anyway, so with that backdrop, I'd just like to share some news from this past week. An Italian court convicted and sentenced 207 people linked to the Drangheta crime group on Monday, last Monday, marking the country's largest mafia trial in 30 years. The three-judge panel acquitted so that was 207 people. They acquitted 131 other defendants. So this Italian anti-mafia directorate considers this Drangheta to be the world's, among the world's largest and most lucrative drug trafficking group. The mobsters were convicted on charges of mafia association, extortion, drug and arms trafficking, and bribery, along with five murders. The convicts received a combination sentence of at least 2,100 years, <laughs> including five life sentences and three 30-year sentences. So who was convicted? All those druggy guys out there? You know, just white. Who was convicted? Several convicted defendants were former public servants including a lawmaker, uh, Giancarlo uh, Catelli, and former police chief, uh, Giorgio Nacelli, ex-mayor Gian, uh, Giano Calippo, and also convicted along with former police chief, oh sorry, financial police chief, Michelle Marino, and former regional counselors, and these two other fellas. In other words, public servants, right? I mean, nobody wakes up and decides, I'm going to be a criminal in my life, and thinks, yeah, great. You know, but things happen out there. For example, also last week, uh, Binance is the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world, Binance it's called, but they went awry and they went uh, and did fraud and they agreed to pay over four billion dollars to settle the government's charge. According to the terms of his plea agreement, the CEO Zhao must pay 50 million dollars of a personal fine as well has resigned as CEO. So, what's with the government cracking down on crypto companies? Zhao's plea comes less than a month after fellow crypto giant FTX founder Sam Bankman was criminally convicted of fraud. How's that? The biggest financial dealings going on, this cryptocurrency, and they're, they're not doing well, you see. There's trouble out there. Okay, now let's branch into uh, the area of the church. Carlton Peterson died last Sunday. Uh, 
after hospice care, brief battle with battle bladder cancer, and he was 70 years old. What's he known for? He was an influential Pentecostal preacher mentored by evangelist Oral Roberts. Uh, Pearson, the founder of Higher Dimensions Family Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 81, uh, the church boasted a membership of about 6,000 by the year 2000. But it shrank to only a few hundred after he began preaching his gospel of inclusion, whatever that was. It's a form of universalism rejecting the biblical doctrine of hell. So I'm bringing up who went Tyndale so we can know what the Word of God says. And then I'm comparing it to how it goes in the world. In Italy, in Binance, our financial institutions. And, and then here's a guy, a Christian guy, that gets off track. And in fact, uh, the Joint College of African American Pentecostal Bishops Congress declared his teachings heretical in 2004. And in 2007 still, he led other clergy members in endorsing <laughs> controversial bills. And later he became a United Church of Christ minister. How's that? So we can get off track and keep telling ourselves, no, we're going fine, in spite of what the Word of God says. Now, one more thing. From last week, the North Georgia Conference of United Methodist Churches on Saturday, voted to allow 261 congregations to disaffiliate from the denomination. There were previously about 700 congregations in North Georgia of this United Methodist Church, leaving it, with, leaving it with only about 440 now. And more than 7,000 congregations have split from the denomination in our country since 2019 and formed their own group. Many of these churches left the United Methodist Church who have left who left hold to the tradition of biblical views on marriage and sexuality. So in other words, some are believing what the Word of God says and others want to pick and choose what the Word of God says. It's dividing congregations. It's widely known, but here's just something that happened last week, factual numbers and all of that. And so some believe one way and some believe another. And here we sit today. You know, if we had a, if I could take a poll of what we all thought about everything, we'd be divided on things. It's normal. But here we are also as a group of people who are looking to God and the Word of God for the help in our lives. And that is our saving grace. For example, Jesus traveled around and did miracles. He raised a girl from the dead. And when the Word spread throughout that district that he did this, brought a girl back to life. What do you suppose was the effect on people who heard it? I suppose that it was, was it always a game changer? I mean, they'd heard about him, and then now, even a, somebody that was dead, he brought her back to life. Some would be skeptical, others, um, others would be hopeful and encouraged. Maybe this is the Messiah to come. Maybe he's our Savior. The Lord and Savior, God is at work. You know, there's the whole range, isn't there? That's fair. But I imagine others were hardened. Others, we can do that. We, we think to ourselves, I don't know how to handle this. I'm not sure which side to go on this. And so be it. Now, I'd like to, so today's, title is going to be, with his help, we can override, we can override what we have learned, what we have grown up with, what we have come to believe, we can override that, and indeed, believers do this. I used to think I was just fine, but now that Jesus has come into the picture, I 
changed what I was thinking, and now I'm thinking, no, I'm believing in Him. I mean, your blood speaks a better word than all the empty things I've heard in this world. We just sing. And so we change our belief to that. So, with His help, we can override. And so, this Romans 12.2, what does that look like? He tells us here in Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We can know the will of God. He helps us that we can test it and that He tests us, in fact. And our minds are renewed and changed. And so, I'd like to take you back to Jeremiah 17. If you'd like to turn to Jeremiah 17. I'll have it on the screen. Fascinating few verses here. Four verses beginning with this. Just a truth. How blessed it is. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts in the Lord. Whose trust is in the Lord? He is like a tree planted by water that sends out roots, its roots, by the stream, and does not fear when heat comes, for it, its leaves remain green, and is not anxious for the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Then, is a new paragraph, where it says, the heart is deceitful. The very next verse. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So we have the power sitting here to Make up our minds, our hearts, about how we're going to go, what it's going to look like. And the Lord is watching and helping. And if we decide, I don't think he really raised that girl from the dead. I don't think all those other people are telling the truth either. You know, it was, would have been hard to face down all the miracles that Jesus did. And I mean, stretch out your hand and walks on the water and and that raging sea, and he says, be still, and boom. And these guys are freaked out, because who could do that, don't you know? Anyway, and yet, this is the same God that is in our head, and that promises to help us, and that gives us good information, like the heart is desperately sick. Who can understand it? My heart is sick. Can I trust my heart? And so... Last week I gave this verse, key verse in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, that says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Make straight your paths. It's a promise. So if we don't lean on our own understanding, it would include not trusting what we normally think. I'm just dissecting a bit. You know how I do from time to time. So that we can... Here's a verse that says, Do not lean on your own understanding. So, do not trust what you think. Not trusting what we have come to believe. Not trusting our gut. Well, my gut says this. Well, let's test that. Is that hitting close to home? What else does it mean? Do not lean on your own understanding. He's trying to help us that we can trust Him and what He says. He's trying to help us with that we can override even our own understanding. I used to think this, but you are helping me to go this direction. That's what repentance is. My whole life was going this way, living for myself, and then He helped me change my direction and go that way and trust Him. How else? And that's the beauty in looking to older believers who believed a long time. I mean, why else was 
Jack Graham saved that he came to Donna's service and saw this room packed and people over there because Donna believed in Jesus. And man, it affected Jack Graham and he got saved because there's no atheists in foxholes. And so he thought, wow, this is impressive. And God impressed him. And he turned to be saved. It helped him override all... You know, he was cantankerous. Many of you, if you don't know Jack Graham, Jim, was he cantankerous? He, Jim's laughing, you know, because he wouldn't have anything to do with the church. I mean, he would mock us. And then he gets baptized in the city. It's awesome. Changes even a guy that's 92. So, here we are, looking to God that He can help us override even our own understanding and instead trust in Him the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to get to God. The Word of God we can trust. And so, you know, it comes to mind Hank's nephew, so his brother's son, uh, died yesterday. What a difficult time. So if you were close to the family, or if it was close to your, you know, it's not hard for Randy, his brother died a month ago, out of the blue, so it's not hard to imagine. But what do you do when it's so close to home? And many of you widows, of course, live through this. What do you do? What survives? What do you do right after? What do you still... I suggest you do what your habits are. You do... You still brush your teeth. You still eat. But the list is really pretty short. They're, they're your habits. Those are the things that you practice and you can decide what to practice. So what do we emphasize? We emphasize reading from God's Word, don't we? Reading the Word of God we, so that we have the habit of hearing from God every day. We have the habit of listening and coming to trust Him more and more. And, and here the start of the year is coming and, and some of us are thinking, yeah, I haven't joined in like everybody, but I want to. And so we start a little bit now because if you do a day or two a week now, when it comes time, you'll be three or four. And then in six months or a year, you'll be doing it every day. Robin, how's that going for you? Pretty good? Yeah. There you go. Robin got saved, and then Jim, after a year or two, started coming. And then he got saved, right? Jim, are you reading every day? Oh, yeah. How's that working for you? Are you sorry about that? Yeah. You could be doing all these other things that are good, Jim. Okay, so you see the point here. It's not hard to add up. And I want to give you a biblical example of who else did this when times got hard. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. John, who would know better than any, the greatest prophet ever. He would know who Jesus was, but there he's suffering in prison. And he sends his disciples to, hey, I, Jesus is doing more. Would you go and confirm that he's really the one we're waiting for? Because I'm, I'm not doing very well in here, right? So here it is, Matthew 11, that we just read this week. When the difficulties came, he turned to Jesus. And that's our encouragement. When things are confusing, he was confused, he was suffering, so he sent his guys to check in with Jesus. Verse 2 here says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you see and what you hear and see. You know, Jesus isn't nervous at the question. He's excited. Just go reassure John by... Just watch and tell him what you see and hear yourself, right? And, he, and it says, the blind received their sight. Now let's just pause. They saw it. How encouraging would that be? And not just one thing. If we saw that one thing, 
And I've heard of that happening in our time. And it was cool, but it didn't change my life, but it was encouraging. The next thing, and the lame walk. So somebody is paralyzed, and here, get up and walk. And then you're on the side. He says, see? <laughs> and then lepers are cleansed. That's a big deal. They're the unclean. Nobody wanted to get near them, and he cleanses them. And then the deaf here. Here, come over here. He puts his hands on their head or, or just says the word. He doesn't have to touch them. And the dead are raised up. You know, he touches the coffin and, and they got to set it down because the guy sits up and he's alive. I mean, he did this. He really did this. And any one of those things are, we can be skeptical and we can land wherever we're going to land. But if God's in this room and he's in your heart and, and your heart is open to be to believe the truth, I mean, all these people saw it and believed. I mean, it was just and before their eyes. The dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them. Who paid attention to the poor? Do you remember when Jesus says, it is harder for a rich man to go to heaven than, than for a camel to go through the eye of the You remember that. And they said, who, th who then can be saved? They were blown away. Like, what? We thought it's just like today. The rich are looked up to. They've the, they're the ones that have made it. The rich, you know. I mean, just, there's so many easy examples about the rich. And that our society wants to be rich. And if somebody becomes rich, everyone thinks, oh, their worries are over. I mean, we just kind of, it, it's part of our culture. It's in us a bit, to varying degrees, but it's in us. And here the poor have the good news preached to them. Why is that important? Because it was prophesied in the Old Testament that it would happen. And so John's disciples see all of this. <laughs> And then they go and tell John to reassure him. It's the word of God that's so powerful. And we get to decide today about it. We get to decide that with his help, we can override this week. It's going to come about. Something's going to happen today or in the next few days where our belief, we used to believe this, but now we're letting in the light of Jesus, and he's helping me to be a little different. I used to not believe that, and now I do. So, for example, churches can believe different things. The church I grew up in, an elder in the church who's still there, took us, the youth group, to a poem reader, and she read our poems, all of us. We all put our hands like this toward the table, and we all felt this power like unmistakable thing happening. And it was not of God, but an elder in the church took us and made us privy to this. And it, they were they were deceptive. It was it was not of God. Can I repeat that loud enough? Okay, so this same fellow believes in reincarnation and spirit guides, and he's still a leader main leader in that church. Okay? So there's trouble out there, and yet there's an answer to all of this. The Word of God. Our believing in the Word of God. The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And we believe Him because He is who He says He is. What about you? Jesus says, Woe to you if you make one of these little ones to stumble, to fall away. And here's this leader in the church taking a bunch of young, impressionable people. And I don't know what happened to the rest of them. But I remember it clearly. It was so powerful. Ah, my eyes are... How do we believe it? Is this good? Or Anyway, you could imagine what was going on. <coughs> but what did... What do, did I believe? What do you believe? That's So if we have the habit, if we're turning to the Word of God and taking Him in 
that helps the light, that's the light into our life so that we can see the truth. He is steadily calling us forward in order to help us order our lives after him. What he says upon his word, with his help, we can override whatever has come before. That's the truth. That's the hope. Whatever has come before, he's the only one with the light, the way, the truth, all of that that can help us override. He told them this parable from Matthew 13, 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. So you see, that's Jesus that we can take into our life. And he'll work through our life if we'll let it. I want to finish with this one story. It's in the 1930s in the Depression. The Depression is affecting families across America. And there's a poor man by the name of E.L. Yates, uh, barely making a living on his sheep farm in West Texas, around Odessa and Midland. He was constantly worrying about how he was going to pay his bills and feed his family. Mr. Yates had given up and was contemplating bankruptcy. He and his family would find some way to make a fresh start once the bank repossessed his farm. But one day, a survey crew from an oil company came to him and asked for permission to drill for oil on his property. The contract stated that he was to receive every eight barrel if any oil was found at 1115 feet they hit a gusher the well produced 80,000 barrels of oil a day oh <laughs> wells soon followed that would produce twice that capacity even 30 years later, government surveys showed wells with a capacity of 120,000 barrels a day. It proved to be one of the richest veins of oil ever found in North America. And Mr. Yates owned it all. The day he purchased the property, he received the oil and mineral rights. Yet he was living on government assistance, a multimillionaire living in poverty. The problem? He did not know the oil was there. He owned it, but he did not know it. Jesus Christ came so that you and I might have life to the full, full and meaningful. Yet many people are not aware of all, all that is theirs, even though it's right at their fingertips. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and that they might have it abundantly. Perhaps you are sitting here today living your life like Mr. Yates with untapped resources right beneath your feet. It doesn't have to stay that way. Is this an oversimplification? Is this a preacher's foolhardy illustration? Somehow trying to take advantage? I mean, really. Untapped resources. I'm encouraged. I, he wants me to allow him to override my faulty thinking. I still got it. Randy got it here a few minutes ago. Admitted the same. We're leaders in this church. And we don't have it all worked out. You see what I'm saying? But God is the one that will come in. And with his help, you and I believe it. We can overcome. We can overcome. Let's pray. God, we want to ask you for your help in our, our minds, our thinking, that we would indeed think rightly, think your thoughts, 
not trust in our own understanding, but trust in you instead, so that our roots go down the living water, and that when trouble comes, we're not afraid. Thank you for your word that we can make the habit of listening to you, walking with you, therefore, and adjusting just our daily steps, little by little. That's what you offer us for this great change. Having you in our lives, life, abundant life. Thank you for your help to encourage us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we dismiss. Thank you. Getting used to not having that closing song. But, uh,